It, um, he was driving on wet pavement doing 75 on I-40, no, I-25, coming back from Socorro. And, um, he must have hit an oil slick. And because of the cruise control on the, and the wet pavement on the oil slick, he lost control of the truck and it went into the guardrail. And then, flipped over several times, wound up on the tires and uh, says that essentially he was, he was unhurt except for... Um, yeah, he looked fine, especially considering he's back to work already. Yeah, he, he has a, <coughs> an airbag burn on one arm. The and he feels a little funny in the jaw where the airbag hit his face. The parking lot seems to be okay. So let's see, where did we stop last time? Was it the Particle in three dimensions, we got that point. Or was, were we always just in Euclidean time? Imaginary time. No, we did the. We did the free particle in real free time. Free particle, yeah. But we didn't do the harmonic oscillator in imaginary time. I don't believe so. I assigned uh, another homework um, just this afternoon. It's um, what I thought was I give you sort of a an exercise involving non-Euclidean engaged theory. Um, it's not that big a deal. On, so the, the Thanks for help. So uh, I considered the case SU. The, the problem is consider an SU2 gauge theory. So the instead of P psi of R down mu psi A mu, what you have Psi bar, say, I should have written alpha probably, gamma mu, TA, alpha beta, <coughs> psi beta, AA mu. So that's the change. Okay. Um, there's another term involving just the A's, but it's not relevant to what I was suggest What I'm thinking for you to do is to consider the case where, um, say, fermion alpha plus fermion beta goes to fermion gamma plus fermion delta. And these t's, you can take the t's in fact to be uh, three of them and just a half the Pauli matrices. So you're talking about the gauge group SU2 for simplicity. So is there a sum over A in this expression? <coughs> so, um, one two. So I thought that, that would be good. Now, um, Let's um, back up 
just a minute and uh, answer a question that someone asked in class. Someone asked, well, can you derive Schrodinger's equation from this pantheonical formalism? formalism and, uh, of course, the answer is yes. You'd be in deep trouble if the answer is no. Um, and uh, so let me, let me go back to one of these equations. These boards are uh, erased, uh, so light. And anyway, what we, what we had was Q double prime e to the minus i epsilon h Q prime. And I'm going to write it as uh, 1 over 2 pi. Um, minus i epsilon v of uh, q prime and then it's an integral e to the minus i epsilon q prime squared over 2m I don't know I don't think we need to keep the prime on p that's <laughs> building or will be the expression that we had. And um, what I want to do is say, well, what does this tell us about um, uh, the uh, time evolution of the wave function? Well, the wave function in general, say, is um, Q prime uh, e to the minus i t h, then some psi. And so what we can say is then, and we can call this psi of q prime and t. And so we can say then that psi of q double prime and t plus epsilon then is uh, an integral of um, Q double prime e to the minus i epsilon h uh, q prime times psi of q prime and t. Um, and let's put everything else. Let's see, that is d, well, dq, okay, it's dq prime. And all right. So that's that. And then the whole thing then is 1 over 2 pi e to the minus i epsilon v of q prime. Um, and then an integral minus infinity plus infinity uh, e to the minus i epsilon p squared over 2m plus i p. Let's see, I think I should have. I think I should have gone one step further here. Yeah, let me go one step further here. This thing, in fact, is um, m over 2 pi i epsilon to the 1. I'm, I'm looking at equation 1723 in the latest version of the notes e to the minus i epsilon v of q prime. And then um, what we have here is um, e the i epsilon. And then I have, and I'm not going to revert to what q prime dot squared is, and it's m q double prime minus q prime squared. Um, over two, oh, okay. uh, two m epsilon squared plus. All right, now that's right. Okay. Oh, there is no, sorry. <coughs> I. Right. 
down. Um, so that means that over here, what we've got is psi of q double prime t plus epsilon then. Let me use um, these notes. Now. This is then going to be this factor here, e to the minus i epsilon v of q um, prime. And then I'm going to call q double prime minus q prime, I'm going to call c. And um, I'm going to say that q double prime then uh, let's see. So q double prime is c plus q prime, and um, <coughs> q prime is q double prime minus c. And so this is an integral then um, e to the i um, epsilon, as I said, m over 2, c squared over epsilon squared, and um, dc, and then psi of, and now what we have is um, q double prime uh, minus c and uh, t. So that's, is this, this should be consistent. And, um, Except that there's this factor here, which I left out, namely this. So we have here an m over 2 pi i epsilon to the 1 half. All right, now what we do is we say, well, this, um, I just will get rid of the, get rid of the uh, funny expression there. And um, we have to do the dc integration. And what we want to do is say that on the left-hand side, this is going to be psi of q double prime and t plus um, epsilon partial psi partial t. So we're moving towards Chardon's equation there. And then we have uh, e to the minus i epsilon v of q prime, this m over 2 pi i epsilon to the 1 half. And now these integrate, what we're going to do is we're going to expand this thing. So we have an integral dc, e to the i m over 2 c squared over epsilon. And then we're going to expand this, so this is going to be psi of um, Q prime and T plus, um, or actually minus, minus C times the partial of psi with respect to X, and then plus C squared over 2 partial 2 psi, partial, well, not X, I'm sorry, partial. Minus dot 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 dc. Okay. And now what we're using here is uh, let's re let me remind you of an integral that I've already quoted, but in a slightly different form. I am c squared over two epsilon dc. This is square root of two pi epsilon i over m. And the related integral, e to the i m c squared over 2 epsilon c squared dc, well, this is just the derivative of this with respect to um, uh, m over 2 epsilon. And if we write this as the square root of, um, what did I say? m over 2 epsilon. This is square root of pi i times m over 2 epsilon to the minus 1 half. So if you differentiate that with respect to m over 2 epsilon, 
you bring down, well, you have to multiply by minus i, you bring down a c squared, and the result is that this is actually equal to um, epsilon i over m times the square root of 2 pi epsilon i over m. I mean, all of this is in natural units with h particle of 1. Okay, so this on the right hand side, um, this integral, the imc squared dc, is just going to give um, the inverse of this square root. And um, so what we're going to have is psi of, actually this is psi, all right, that's psi of q double. Psi of q double prime t plus epsilon partial psi partial t is then um, e to the minus i epsilon v of q prime. And um, we have then m over 2 pi i epsilon to the 1 half. And now doing these integrals, this integral gives us um, the top thing, which is square root of 2 pi i epsilon over m psi of prime t, so that's doing the, d, well I have two dc's, so let me get rid of one of them. That's doing this integral over c. This integral vanishes, because it's odd. This integral kicks out an extra factor of, F, of epsilon i over m, and so we get plus um, epsilon i over m square root of 2 pi i epsilon over m, and then partial 2 psi partial prime uh, squared. And then the other terms which are insignificant. And so now these, all these square roots cancel, and what we get is psi plus epsilon psi dt is equal to, oh, we have to expand this. So we get um, 1 minus i epsilon v times psi plus i epsilon over m uh, partial to psi partial to squared. Or, well, let's do it. And so now the size cancel from one side, from both sides. What's left is epsilon d psi dt equals. We drop the <coughs> the cube double primes and the cube primes, even though they're not the same on the left and the right. <coughs> um, they're really the same. Uh, what? Uh, I think the difference between the two is what we expanded over here. In other words, this should be, yeah, this, should, this is q double prime, see, okay. minus c. Good question. Do I owe anybody else a candy? Does anybody else ask a question? But uh, good call there. All right, so what's left then is uh, minus i epsilon v psi, and then plus i epsilon over m psi double prime. Let's let me write it that way, and let me write this as a psi dot. Okay, so the epsilon cancels, and uh, multiplying through by i, we get i psi dot equals minus one over m psi double prime plus v psi. That Stratus equation, apart from a factor of two, oh, that's because there's a one half here. So this was actually two. Okay, so that's Stratus equation. All right. 
So that's the derivation. Um, I crib that from Feynman's thesis, um, 1942, I think. So it's interesting how the, 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 the derivation comes um, actually from the from the very basic part of the uh, derivation of the path integral, namely this double prime minus two prime. Okay. So we ignored higher order terms when we expanded yeah, 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 yeah. So is that interesting at all? I mean, <laughs> well, no. The higher order terms are higher order in epsilon. You see, the the C, you have C cubed, or well, the C cubed <coughs> term vanishes, right? Mm -hmm. The C the fourth term, well, all the odd ones would right. have an epsilon squared. Mm -hmm. The second limit is epsilon goes to zero, right? Or no? Well, we didn't have to take that limit. No. I guess if we we were going, yeah, to it would it would cancel in these first ones. I mean, if and you then there would be epsilons left over in the other ones. Yeah. And then we could let epsilon go to zero. And, right. I guess if you ask a question of somebody else, that this this whole thing's in the limit is epsilon goes to zero. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. All right. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> Okay, now, um, we've already done the, um, the free particle in uh, imaginary time and um, also in real time, right? So we've done the two. Okay. Now, if we go back to the free particle in imaginary time, uh, well, actually, we did a particle in imaginary time. We didn't bother to do the free. If we do the free time particle and in three dimensions, what we have is Q of beta e to the minus beta H, Q at zero. This turns out to be M over two pi beta to the one three half, sorry. E to the minus M over two beta minus Q zero squared over <coughs> Beta. If, if you have the answer in real time, is it not just a trivial substitution in between? The two? Um, um, yeah, you can you can if you want do that, or you can um, think about actually doing it. I mean, the way. But there's a slight difference in that one will give you the Hamiltonian, and one will give you the Lagrangian, right? Because of this right. I squared when you complete the square for the right. Gaussian integral. Yeah. So you can, I don't think you can just. No. I don't know. I, don't know. I mean, it's. I can agree with both of you, okay? <laughs> however, <laughs> however much that may seem to conflict. Um, after all, we had eight years of Clinton, we did pretty well. Um, if we if we go back then to uh, let me use the eraser in ordinary units this is minus h over kt this is then mkt over two pi h bar squared to the three halves we then have an h bar squared here. And um, KT up there. Okay. And and um, if we want to go to the, to, if we want to examine the ground state of the system, then we take a limit where T goes to zero. Um, and in fact, what we can do is we can compare this with uh, a solution of the diffusion equation. 
and in fact, it, um, it, it is the solution of the diffusion equation with a diffusion constant given by h bar over 2n. Um, so, um, I'll just leave that there. Um, now, uh, I want to apply the trick that I mentioned before. Remember, what, if the Hamiltonian the action, I should say, is quadratic in the variables, um, then what you can do is you can find a process that's stationary, that is to say the classical process, and you expand about the classical process, and then what you find is that the first order term is zero, first order correction to the action is zero, that is to say, the action of Q classical plus delta Q is the action of Q classical uh, plus uh, the action of um, delta Q, it turns out. Um, and then plus higher order terms if the action is more than quadratic. If the action is quadratic, the thing just stops like that. And this is also true in imaginary time. And so, um, as I say in the notes, biologists have mice and rats. Um, physicists have the harmonic oscillator. And so I'm going to write down the harmonic oscillator p squared over 2m plus uh, m omega squared q squared over 2. And um, so I'm going to look at, we're in one dimension again, e to the minus th zero, and so this is some normalization factor. By the way, you notice in this derivation of uh, Schrodinger's equation, it was important to keep straight what this normalization, what this integration factor was. When, when, when we went to the full-blown path integral, I, we had n over two of these, where n went to infinity, and I just called that some mysterious factor n. But um, it's, and as I, and I mentioned and stress now that it cancels in ratios of integrals. Um, but notice that in this derivation, the exact value of that was uh, relevant. Okay, so, okay, so this is e to the minus integral zero to t, one half m u dot squared of t prime, say, plus a half m omega squared, q squared of t prime, uh, dt prime, and then all that dq. So this is what e to the minus th between two uh, q eigenstates is. And um, people call this structure here, in other words, this thing integrated, people call it either the Euclidean action or uh, otherwise it's just a time integral of the, um, of the energy because this is the Hamiltonian density effectively written in terms of Q. And, um, Okay, so now what we want to do though is we want to find, uh, last time we used this for the case where S was actually the action, so it was a time integral of Lagrangian. Here we have a time integ integral of something else, but we can also ask that it be stationary. Okay, so that we can play a trick like this. But that means then that the thing we want is that zero should be the variational derivative of the Euclidean action with respect to um, Q should vanish. Q sub epsilon, I'm going to call that. And uh, so if we take seriously what a variational derivative is, it's uh, d, by, uh, d by d epsilon, the Euclidean action of some path Q uh, e 
uh, plus epsilon times some h. And we want to set this equal to zero. And so this is zero is d by d epsilon, an integral from zero to t of a half m, and then we have u epsilon dot squared plus epsilon h dot squared plus a half m omega squared, and now q epsilon plus qe plus epsilon h squared, and all that dt. Okay, so this is requiring that the action be stationary. And um, this d by d epsilon, then, the, the, the big terms don't involve epsilon. The terms in epsilon squared, and this is at epsilon equal to zero, and the uh, terms that are epsilon squared kind of vanish in that limit, even when you take the derivative. And what's left is zero is an integral of m q Euclidean dot of t prime, h dot of t prime, plus n omega squared uh, q Euclidean of t prime, h of t prime, dt prime. If you now integrate by parts on this term, you get rid of this dot, you get a minus sign, you get a double dot here. And now you want this to vanish for any h, and that tells us that um, q Euclidean should satisfy the equation. q Euclidean double dot should be equal to omega squared q Euclidean. Now, this is this is so to speak a Euclidean uh, a classical equation of motion. It's not the one or an ordinary harmonic oscillator, because an ordinary harmonic oscillator has Q classical dot is minus omega squared Q classical. Okay. So this is the opposite. Well, nonetheless, um, we can have a solution to this. And the solution is Q Euclidean at T prime is A e to the omega T prime plus B e to the minus omega T prime. Obviously, these two both satisfy this equation. We can write no, it in terms notice of, there were no i. We can write it in terms of cosh and cinch as well, right? Sure. By the way, I found an error in uh, mathematics. Not mathematics, maple. Oh, that's fine. I don't use that. Oh, you, so what do you use? Not that. Huh? <laughs> mathematics, I guess. And do you, do you, can we chat afterwards? Because I'd like to try this integral on mathematics again. I guess. Okay, so this is uh, the solution. Uh, what are A and B? A are constants, and they're Q sub T, E to the minus omega T, minus Q zero, E to the minus two omega T, divided by one minus E to the minus two omega T. Remember T, the problem I've had writing up these notes is that um, I wanted t to be the time interval. That forced me to use t prime. I would have used capital T. That's the temperature. So I, I don't know, I'm stuck with these stupid primes. Anyway, b is just q0 minus a, it turns out. And then the Euclidean action of the stationary solution, Q Euclidean, turns out to be a half m omega times a squared e to the two omega t minus one minus b squared e to the minus two omega t minus one. Okay. So that's what the Euclidean action is. And uh, the Euclidean action then for an arbitrary path Q, in other words, Q Euclidean plus uh, delta Q. Yeah, I think I should rewrite that equation. Oh, no, it's all right. Anyway, 
is equal to the Euclidean action of the Euclidean solution plus the Euclidean action of delta Q. Where this delta Q, of course, is a loop because Q, Q Euclidean plus delta Q has to go from Q0 to Qt in time t. And so delta Q has to go from 0 to 0 in time t. And so that's a loop. And the result then is that Q sub t e to the minus th Q0 is then n f of t e to the minus s e of Q e. Where f of t is what happens when you do the path and go over delta p. Now, was that too fast? Let me just uh, let me just do this sort of backwards. This is then an integral e to the minus Euclidean action of q e plus delta q, and uh, we can just as well say d delta q. Okay, that's what it is. But this separates into these two terms because this is stationary. And so this is integral e to the minus se of qe minus se of delta q d delta q. This is just a number. So it's e to the minus se of qe integral e to the minus se of delta q d delta q, and this is over only loops, loops delta q. So this is only a function of time. And so it's some, some uh, the, the standard n that comes out of uh, all these patent rules, some, some function of time. That's what this means. And it doesn't involve q. Uh, t equal q0. And uh, moreover, this thing is then n f of t, and we know what se of qe is, it's this, so this is e to the one half, actually I seem to have a big minus sign here, there should be a minus here. goes to infinity to project out the ground state to get something useful out of this. If I were Schwinger, I'd be able to get out all the eigenstates and their eigenvalues and everything. But I'm just going to do the simple thing of take the limit t goes to infinity. So in the limit uh, t goes to infinity, what happens is a goes to q sub t e to the minus omega t. B goes to q0, since this is going to 0. Um, and the limit t to infinity of um, qt e to the minus th q0 is e to the minus t e0, and of course this is the thing that I've said many times, where this is the ground state of the theory. In other words, h0 is e0, 0. So this is the lowest energy state. In other words, this thing becomes a projection operator on the ground state of the theory, and um, so in other words, you insert a complete set of states. In other words, if I want to actually 
do this in detail. It's this. It's sum e to the minus t e n the state in n q zero. That's what this is. Now, the limit t goes to infinity. The only one left is e zero. And so, what do we have? What we have then. <laughs> e to the minus t t zero q t zero zero q zero is n f of t e to the one half m aha and now this minus sign that I needed is actually quite nice minus m omega q t squared plus q zero squared. Notice the minus sign. Okay, um, well that allows us to infer what the ground state wave function is. Namely, we can infer that q0 is m omega over pi h bar to the one quarter. This is just a normalization factor. But then e to the minus a half m omega q squared over h bar. I just Put in natural units. I mean, uh, got out of the natural units, went to SI units. Okay, in other words, this one, QT0, that's that part of the exponential. 0Q0 zero zero is this part of the exponential. And the F of T turns out to be that. And as I said, this gives you, the, the, you can argue that this comes from normalization. There's an overall phase that one couldn't get, but on the other hand, the overall phase is arbitrary, so one can't ask for too much. Um, any, any questions there? It's a good time to ask questions, because we're going to take a, um, we're going to start doing something different. <clears throat> came from is basically because f of t isn't a function of q0 or q t. Right, well that's t of course, it's just a function of t. But, um, yeah, it's good you asked that because um, this is, um, this is actually one of Feynman's many tricks. There's this whole sequence of things. Dirac had his insights, Feynman had his tricks. And one of the Feynman tricks is this thing that I've just been exploiting here. Namely, when you have this path integral here that's only over loops, the only thing it can depend on is t. There are loops that go from 0 to 0 in time t, and this is the Euclidean action. So it could involve m and omega, but it can't involve q0 or q sub t. And, um, so that's, uh, that's the poetry thing. All right. Now, the Heisenberg uh, position operator is E to the I T H Q E to the minus I T H. So Q is Q with time zero, or it's Q independent of time, or it's the Schrodinger position operator. And uh, the Heisenberg one is this, this is the time dependent so It could, be, could the, be any operator. Huh? Flip the, the minus sign? Because you can, you can go from... Cause this better be the right order. Uh, well, I'm sorry, it right It is? Pretty sure it's right. Because typical Schrodinger evolution is a, is a minus Right, mm -hmm. evolution on the state minus yeah, well, I. That's the operator, man. Think yeah, about yeah, it. but you can you can put that out in front and then insert the identity. This is at least where the reason butter comes, right? And you, 
Um, all right, let's 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 let me show why this is the case, and it's great that you asked the question. So in the in the Heisenberg picture, the states don't change in time. So psi q of t psi okay, or for that matter phi. So the matrix element of q of t at time I'm sorry, the matrix element of q at time t in the Heisenberg picture is phi of zero psi of zero q of t. Okay? But now we see what is this? This is q, this is e to the minus i t h psi, and then this is phi e to the i t h. Okay? So now you see <coughs> this is phi t q psi t. Right? So it is it is right. I'm so my minus sign here, but this one I got. Alright, now um, so this this is the uh, way it is in real time. In imaginary time, we have the Euclidean time evolution. And this is e to the th q, e to the minus th. Okay. And now, just as we had time-ordered products when we were doing perturbation theory, we can have Euclidean time-ordered products, products. And so, for example, we can say q sub t, um, the e to the minus th is gratuitous there. What we have here is qe t1 qe t2 e to the minus th q minus t. So this is um, what I'm writing and this is in fact uh, Q sub T, E to the minus T H, and this is a Euclidean time ordered product of Q E of T1, Q E of T2. Okay, this, and, and I'm assuming that T1 is greater than T2. So that this is actually that. Okay. And now, let's use our formulas for Q E at T1 and QE of T2, then this is Q sub T, E to the minus T minus T2, H, Q, E to the minus, well, sorry, I've got this back, it's T1. I had one and two interchange in my notes, and so now I'm having to do it. All right, so, so we can think of this, this is some state which I'm calling Q sub minus T. Then we, the, we Euclidean time evolved this up a distance T um, plus T2. Then we hit Q, then we go from T2 to T1, hit Q again, then we go from uh, T1 to, to T this way and forward. All right. Now what we're going to do is write this as a path integral. And of course, what, what we know how to do with path integrals, we know how to write e to the minus th as a path integral. It's a path integral of the energy density. Then we have a q, another e to the minus th, another path integral of the energy density, and then another path integral of the energy density. The result is that Q sub T, this is just a state, E to the minus TH, Euclidean time water product of QE of T1, Q 
somehow know how to do path integrals analytically, you can do this thing. Um, otherwise, you can somehow, um, if you, since you only have one, if you're doing physics only in one dimension, you can break up this Q of T uh, into, you know, n steps. n can be a hundred, a thousand, let it be a parameter in a program. And, um, you can just uh, compute this ratio of integrals. And in fact, this ratio of integrals is, 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 um, can, be, can be conveniently and efficiently done with a Monte Carlo routine. And uh, so what you, and, and when you, just let me say what that would be. It would be a sum, one over n, And it would be just Q, uh, Q sub i of T1, Q sub i of T2. That would be all it would be. But these Qs 
would be functions of Q going from minus T to T and functions that would occur with a frequency given by this probability distribution. In other words, probability of Q of T is e to proportional to e to the minus SE of Q. With that probability distribution, you then generate a sequence of n functions Q of T, and then you compute this sum. And of course, you take the limit n going to infinity. So that's what all this means. Just I hope demythologizing. All right. Now, uh, this was ordinary T, but if we're now going to let if we let T go to infinity, then what do we have? We have e to the minus T H on Q sub minus T is then e to the minus t ground state energy, ground state dyadic, q sub minus t. And so we have that occurring. We have two factors of e to the minus t e0 occur, one here and one there, one here and one there, so they cancel. We'd have this matrix element occur here and there, they cancel. Here and there, they cancel. And the result is that we'd be left with the following formula. We'd be left with ground state, time order product, QE of T1, QE of T2, Ground state equals ratio of these two path intervals, Q E of T1, Q E of T2, E to the minus S E of Q DQ divided by integral E to the minus S E of Q DQ. And when I'm writing SE here, what I meant was SE of Q infinity minus infinity. In other words, you integrate over all time. Well, this is an important result. I did it for the case of two Qs so that I wouldn't wear myself out and so that um, it would be reasonably clear. But it's clear that you can put in 3, 4, or n, and the resulting formula is ground state time ordered product q of t1 dot 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 q of tn. Actually, there's still only two q's. Integral q of t1 q of tn e to the minus S E Q infinity minus infinity T Q divided by integral e to the minus S E Q infinity minus infinity T Q. So that's why I wrote a right parenthesis. That's the ratio, and that's an important equation. And it's important because you see. This whole business of PAM integrals works not simply for a quantum system of one variable Q, but N Qs, or as you make the transition to field theory from quantum mechanics, these Qs can be fields. And uh, what one winds up with then is an expression for mean value in the vacuum, the time order product of n fields, Euclidean time order, is this type of an integral. And I did this in Euclidean space, but we could have done it in Minkowski space. In that case, it would be the mean value. Well, the tricky part for, for you see, the Euclidean space got us automatically in the limit t goes to infinity and projected out the vacuum. So one needs another argument 
from Minkowski space that goes to the vacuum. So I have to leave that aside. Um, let's uh, look at this expression here, though, one more time. This thing is time-ordered. And why is it time-ordered? Well, it was time-ordered because, you see, it was this time-ordering that brought us the successive factors of um, precisely these factors, t minus t plus t2, t1 minus t2, t minus t1. These factors came from the Euclidean time ordering and the definition of the Euclidean, uh, uh, an operator in Euclidean time. That's why the left-hand side is time ordered. The right-hand side doesn't have time ordering because, of course, these cubes of t1 through tn, these are just numbers. These are just values of the function. The operator we're integrating over all functions q. And uh, that function then we evaluate at t1 through tn, multiply all the numbers together. Um, what it's really a shame that that we haven't gotten very far doing path integrals analytically. I mean, we can do the Gaussian path integrals. We can't do much beyond that. And um, that's a pity. Um, I don't know. The, uh, I, I really think that the future of, of science is in India and China just because of the numbers. And um, so there are a billion Indians and a billion Chinese. Um, Maybe one of them will figure out how to do these things analytically and be way ahead of the game. Um, of course, you know, an American could do it too. I wish you all, I wish us all luck. All right, are there any questions before I go on to say the next topic? topic then is finite temperature field theory. Field theory at a finite temperature. And so what I want to do is first write the Hamiltonian as an integral a half pi squared of x. So I'm again considering a spin zero here. Grad phi of x squared <coughs> I have m squared phi of x squared, the mass term, and then some polynomial in phi of x. d cubed x. Okay, so that's the, that's the Hamiltonian thing between the integral of the d cubed x, the Hamiltonian density. P is a polynomial, it's usually quartic. You might say, well, why is it that we have this thing? phi squared plus a polynomial. Why not something more interesting? Eh. Um, what what is it for? Excuse me? What is it for? Is that like a potential or something? Right. P, <coughs> P is the thing that generates interactions. In other words, if you okay. just, P is zero, this is just a free, a free okay. scale field. Um, but, um, I think theories where you take phi squared and p and throw it into some more interesting form are quite interesting. Shouldn't be as neglected as they are. Anyway, I'm going to call all of this v of phi. And so now our h is just an integral of pi squared over 2 plus v of phi dq x. And so effectively, this is um, like just one variable phi um, at but one for each space point. And now, remember, in order to do the path integrals, we needed eigenstates of q and p. Well, here, we're going to introduce eigenstates of the field operators at time 0. Okay. 
So here, phi prime is an eigenvalue, but it's a function. So this is this is a this thing is a simultaneous eigenvector of phi of x for every x. And um, similarly, this is an, an eigen, simultaneous eigenvector of pi of x for all x. The reason why this is possible, of course, is that we have that phi of x comma zero and phi of x prime comma zero are compatible permission operators because they com commute. The basic commutation relations that we learned weeks ago were, the, were those plus this one. So we can have simultaneous eigenvectors of pi at all x and phi at all x. Of course, these two things are two radically different vectors. And remember the normalization of the, in other words, just in one, this is, well, again, I don't remember what the Peston Schroeder factor is, it's probably pi. If, you, if you're in one dimension, it's q. So, forget the two pi, there's a delta function here. So they're orthogonal when the eigenvalues are different. When the eigenvalues are the same, they're not normalized. So these are unnormalized on unnormalizable states. Moreover, there are also states of infinite energy, uh, just as these are. In other words, the Q states are infinitely sharp in position, therefore in momentum they're infinitely vague and uncertain. That means that the, their momentum values go way out to infinity, so the the, the kinetic energy in that state is infinite. Is this why we prefer to look at the fields in their decomposition in terms of momentum creation in annihilation operators? Uh, how should I say? <clears throat> that, that, what, what, what I mean is these states, Q and Q prime, are convenient in quantum mechanics, but we don't think of them as physical, particularly physical because they're infinite in energy states. And the same thing with the pi's are infinite energy states. And this is something that I think some people have lost sight of. Uh, I, I, I hope that they now have regained sight, appreciation of the fact that these are not finite energy states. But they're very convenient states for manipulation. We're going to use them. Um, but uh, to have states that, are, that have some of the properties of these eigenstates, but R of finite energy can use coherent states. The states that Flower and used one like with all those Schwinger had them before. Schwinger probably got them from Hayden. I don't know where they started. Anyway. Okay. Um, what's the inner product of these states? So let me use a little bit of blackboard that we have left. You remember that uh, Q prime, P prime is um, e to the i, Q prime, P prime divided by square root of 2 pi. Well, similarly, what we can say is that phi prime, phi prime is some factor that for some reason I called S, and then it's E to the i integral phi prime of x phi prime of x d cubed x period. Oh, that's what it is. So this is just the analog of this, but whereas here you only have one, here you have infinitely many and you have to integrate over them. And there's a bugger factor here. It's 1 over 2 pi here. I'm not even going to think about what it is there. All right, and we can we can have completeness relations. The completeness relation would be pi prime, pi prime, but now d pi prime is 
the identity operator, and similarly, this is, an, is uh, a suitable integral over phi prime, phi prime, d phi prime. So these are resolutions of the identity operator. But once you have this, everything goes through just as we did it for the case of um, a single physical variable. Um, uh, so I suppose the place to go is over here because this is the darkest platform. Are there any questions though? Because you might be getting to this, but why why did we call this finite temperature? Excuse me? Why did you call this finite temperature? Oh, because um, I'm going to compute hey, matrix elements of e to the minus beta h. Okay. So. Yeah. You are know, a so. <laughs> um. All right. So proceeding the way we have in the past, e to the minus epsilon h. Phi prime. What's this going to be in the limit of cos epsilon going to zero? Well, it's going to be an integral of phi double prime e to the minus epsilon over two integral pi squared d cubed x pi prime, and then here pi prime e to the minus epsilon integral v of phi d cubed x phi prime d phi prime. So I just I've just done the usual thing where we h is is a half pi squared plus v <coughs> integrated. Uh, lambda epsilon going to zero we can separate them. We insert an identity operator. And now what that gives us is some sort of an S e to the minus <coughs> epsilon integral v d cubed x times an integral e to the e to the let me just say integral minus pi epsilon pi squared over two plus i pi prime pi double prime minus pi prime x d pi prime. Once again, we're going to say that phi prime dot is uh, phi double prime minus phi prime over epsilon. And lo and behold, what we get at this point then is Phi double prime, then e to the minus epsilon h phi prime is then some s prime e to the minus integral phi dot squared over 2 epsilon plus epsilon v of phi prime. And this is a prime integral. Uh, d cubed x. There. So that'll be our um, expression, and um, actually I'm a little puzzled. Uh, do I really mean that there's a 1 over epsilon there? I think this might be wrong. I think we want this epsilon to be up here. I don't know what I do with it. I don't know the denominator. Anyway, we can check this. Okay, so I made the homework due Monday. Is that okay? It's basically, you know, you. I'm not asking you to. 
take the absolute value squared, sum over spins, none of that. Just write down the Feynman rules and use the Feynman rules to write down my hand. All right, so let's let's end here just a little at the end of the hour.